This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello and welcome to another program of Rich Dad World. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as always, you know, we always say the most important asset you have is right between your ears. And nothing's more important than today than your financial education. So today we're going to be talking with a couple new experts. I've got, of course, Robert here with me. Um, and then we have a couple other experts who are going to talk about, you know, there's always all kinds of investments that will cash flow. And we always want to look at new opportunities, what's coming down the pike, where are the opportunities, where are the threats. So we've got a very full packed show for you today. And as I said, just thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching. Um, and please do your best to, you know, not just educate yourself, but educate those around you as well, because these are uncommon, that's an understatement, uncommon times. Um, and we want to prepare as much as possible for whatever shows up at our doorstep. So welcome, and I will pass it over to Robert. Well, welcome to and I'm very happy to have Andy Tanner, my expert on the paper macro business, and Mara Katusa, who uh, I, we, I, I call him my brother. We grew up in the same town or city together, Vancouver, British Columbia. We're generations apart, but you haven't lived until you invested in Vancouver. <laughs> It's, it's, it's what the Wild West used to be. It's now moved to Vancouver. So uh, I remember when I first went there years ago in the 80s, and people, and people were investing in NASDAQ and uh, you know, the New York Stock Exchange. And I said, I'm in Vancouver. And everybody said, you must be a crook then. I said, no, I just like, I just, I just like the characters in Vancouver better because they're, they're wild men. So we have Andy Tanner, but we have Marion Katusa, who is, um, a denizen of the Vancouver exchange markets, but he is a, a you know, he's freaking genius at what he's doing. And he's going to be talking about some of the biggest investments coming down. And the reason this is an important time, I think Andy would agree with this, is when people ask me, this Jim Records, who's a friend of mine, he always describes complexity, <clears throat> and people don't know what complexity means. And what's happening in the world today, things are getting more and more complex, not less complex. So my description of complexity is, it's like you start with a little house of cards, but you gotta keep it up so you put more, house, more cards underneath of it, but you gotta keep that up so you put more cards underneath of it. And pretty soon you got this house of cards this big. And so the question is, what do you invest in? I said, well, right now, I'm investing standing clear of that house of cards. And so that's really what this subject is about, is how you can still profit no matter what happens in the coming markets. So Andy, I mean, you love that 401k, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> and let me, just inter let me just interrupt for a moment. If those of you who do not know Andy Tanner by now, yeah, um, Andy Tanner's that. our Rich Dad advisor. He wrote the book, Stock Market Cash Flow. And one of the things we love about Andy is I never knew until I met Andy that you can actually get cash flow from the stock market. So um, I just wanted to let people know in case, because you look a little different, Andy, you've lost a lot of weight and you're very healthy. So in case people didn't recognize you, <laughs> take it away. <laughs> well, thanks Robert and Kim. And to answer uh, Robert's questions, no, I do not like 401ks because they're the ultimate retail investment. Uh, if, if a person were to read your book, The Cash Flow Quadrant, they learn that there's four different ways they can pursue uh, an income, being an employee, being self-employed, owning a business or investing in businesses. And when people say, should I put money in a 401k? I say, well, decide which quadrant you want to be in. If you want to be an E, then you know maybe that's going to be the best you can do. But I think they make Wall Street rich. Uh, I don't know very many people at all. In fact, I don't know one person that, that went from poor to very, very wealthy because they invested in a 401k. And so, uh, so no, I don't, I don't care for those much. Robert Kiyosaki is the best-selling author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, a 10 Roberts free virtual wealth building event. Claim your free access now at richdadfree.com. Go to richdadfree.com. Yeah. So Mara, would you give us your background? I mean, I know um, it's, it's really been enjoyable working with you because you're one of the smartest guys I've ever met. But you're a calculus teacher at one time? 
Yeah. So I start from the academia, got bored with that really quickly teaching calculus. And, you know, what I realized was if I could take my skills with, you know, my quest for knowledge and traveling, it just happened that I was born and raised in Vancouver, here, British Columbia in Canada on the West coast. And as Robert mentioned, it was the wild, wild West of resource development. Historically, it's the finance capital of the world for mining, for gold, copper, silver, most uh, hard commodities. And, and I started out in tungsten uh, very early. You know, I became what, what many called the tungsten king of Canada and then uranium very big in 2004. So by starting there, then was the founder with Jim O'Rourke and Rod Shire on Canada's third largest producing copper mine, youngest person ever on the TSX as a director and largest investor. I, I had the benefit of understanding the math side of things, understanding the risk, but learning the geology side and the engineering side. And I traveled the world for 20 years doing that. And I think today is the largest independent financier of resources in the world. I've taken a very different approach. I've been there and done that. I've gone to the risky parts of the world, put body armor on, had French Foreign Legion as my bodyguards on, in whether I was in Iraq or Kosovo, places where literally uh, your life was at risk because the, the concept was go to where the gold is and you needed big risk to get big returns. Then when you go through that, you realize that that's not necessarily true. Look, I, I'm a math guy from the background, but I'm, I'm a you know, I'm known as a gold guy or, you know, all these commodities that I've been involved in financing and building. But I think it's it, it, the risk is mispriced in our markets right now. And I'm hated for it because the bankers don't like me bringing these things up because investors start asking questions. And that's a no-no in the banking world. Don't ask questions, right? Marin, so, Marin, you're saying that investors are, are not going to go into these risky areas anymore. Well, they are, but I think what's going to happen, the cash flows are going to be significantly impacted because the governments are changing the structure. They want more of a good thing. That's the one thing politicians are going to do. And if you're in Chile or Ecuador, or DRC, Mongolia, how much more easier if you're a politician to blame the foreign company for pollution and say, we need more of the ownership. They're not paying their fair share. It's, 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 it's so simple to see, but the investment community is not pricing that risk in. Kim, you and I know that really well because, you know, we started a gold mine. You know, I traveled to Peru, Mongolia, China, and we found gold in China. We struck gold in China. We took it public on the TSC, Toronto Stock Exchange. And as soon as it was proven, the Chinese government said, thank you. And they took it. So that's called, they call it nationalization. I call it theft. But anyway, Afghanistan to me was the start of the downfall of or what Marin was talking about. They're going to start taking back what they think belongs to them, which it probably does. But uh, like when Biden shut down the Keystone, immediately Tim and I started buying US oil. You know, because if he shut down Keystone, and now Afghanistan and all that shut down, the price of oil started to climb. So the investment opportunity that Kim and I saw was just to be back into Texas and invest there. But if you're counting, kind of, <laughs> worst of all, I think Andy, if you are my age, all the baby boomers counting on a 401k and the house of cards has never been bigger, what would you say to every baby boomer who's waiting for their 401k? Well, I, I hope you've enjoyed your past <laughs> because your future might be rough. Yeah. Um, and on a serious note, I do what a smart person does. I'd get, me so, I'd get myself some help and I'd say, look, get a coach, get someone that can help you. One, one of the things I say often that, that I got from Robert uh, that resonated with me is, when I, we read the rich, we read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, my wife and I, and when we read it the first time, we said, well, I want to buy real estate. I want to buy assets, not liabilities, asset liabilities. And we failed completely. And I said, well, let's read it again. And Marcy uh, said, okay. And she grabbed the cover. She says, I think I've got it. I said, you've got what? She goes, it's in the cover, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. We've already got the Poor Dads. We're halfway there. And that <laughs> shift... And then not to disparage my own dad, but that shift was we stopped looking for deals 
and we started looking for people that could help us learn. Right. And when we stopped looking for deals and started looking for people that could help us learn, things seemed to got better. So if you're a person that uh, is in this house of cards and you see it might fall on you and you might not be positioned well, maybe you stop asking advice from Marin and Robert saying, well, what should I buy with $10,000? And maybe start looking for people that can help you. At least that, that worked out for Marcy and I pretty well. So Kim, would you mind talk about Frank, who was our, he was our coach, our guide, our mentor in Vancouver, the wild, wild west. I mean, without Frank, we've been eaten alive. Well, we, got, we did get eaten alive, but without Frank, it's, it's the best education we ever got, right? Yeah, Frank, Frank was a great mentor. He's since passed, um, wonderful mentor. And I learned, I, I never knew anything about the stock market, much less taking, taking uh, companies public. Um, but I learned very, very quickly how the game is played. And it is a game. Um, and... He and I look back on some of the best mentors and best coaches I've had in my lifetime, and, and Frank is right up there. Um, taught, taught us a lot, taught us the inside, um, asked asked us the best questions. I think that was one of his gifts. He knew how to ask the question to get us to look and to learn. So yeah, a great mentor. And not only that, you know, man, what he did was he put us in charge of the the Hoy Polloi at the Toronto, Toronto Stock Exchange. So immediately we had access, you know, to credible people. But when, you know, what I was laughing about is there were some of the happiest days of my life on the streets of Toronto, I mean, of Vancouver, because I heard, I heard every bad deal possible. <laughs> I heard goldfish deals. I, I don't know what else I heard, but they're pitching deals constantly. It was just a deal pitching. You know, Vancouver was a deal pitching town. And so without Frank to guide us and to, and to have uh, Tom Allen and all these other guys we ran into, but that's what a coach and a guy does. So when Marin called up and he said, I have a green new deal, it's carbon credits. There was always, there was already a simpatico because the moment Marin, I mean, Marin said Vancouver, I said, okay, I kind of have an idea who I'm dealing with. And then Marin started to talk, but I, I also knew that Marin had access. He knows what he's doing. And a lot of them, also those guys in Vancouver, don't know what they're doing. They're just pitching deals. Most of the companies are run by guys that would be underqualified to wash cars, never mind park cars. <laughs> but the way it's structured, they pop on a suit, they, they look good, they have a good story, or they're a good storyteller. They get the right lawyers and accountants. They de-risk themselves, but all the risk goes on to the investors. And that's the scariest part of the whole market. Uh, it's not the management teams that are going to go down. And there's a few simple rules. Why would you ever buy stock in, into a company that, you know, is trading at $10, but the management's cost base is one penny? Are your interests aligned right off the bat? No. So you don't need to be someone like me who's been, you know, doing this for 20 years and is, you know, if there's a deal that comes through Canada, I'm one of the first places it comes because it's a, I'm a big source of capital but just some general rules of thumb. Would I take my family to this location where the project is? And if I don't feel comfortable doing that, would I want to build something there? Mm, if not, you probably shouldn't go unless the value proposition exceeds, the upside exceeds all risk. What's the insider's cost? Are we at the same price? In certain deals, you can get in cheaper than what management bought. That's a Warren Buffett type of thing to do. Am I buying it considerably under its true cash flow value, or do I got to jump through crazy hoops to even potentially build this thing and maybe one day get cash flow? I'm not a high risk guy. I don't like going to places. And when I was young and single, who cares? I loved traveling around the world. I lived a rock star life for 15 years. It was fantastic. But when you want to make real money, you don't need to go to Mongolia or Turkey or Argentina. Remember, these places are where dreams go to die and money goes to heaven. So it's about cash flow, buying it very cheap at a discount to its net asset value. And if you follow the biggest guys in the business, it's not rocket science. It's about positioning yourself. And if you feel like you've missed the boat, you already have. Wait for the next one. There's always something new coming along. And any comments on that, Andy? Because that's what... You're not a buy and hold guy, are you? I mean, the, the you're not a financial planner, should I say? 
<laughs> well, you know, I'm not a financial planner, and I'm, I'd like to thank Marin for being here because he just said everything I'd like to say. Uh, <laughs> you know, when I, if I can make this simple, one of the things I do is I have my kids play the cash flow game. And I recommend that for adults, too, because you learn what a financial statement is. And when you do that, you can act like a businessman rather than a financial advisor or a trader. And, and what I mean by that is if you really listen to what Marin said, is he's not buying a piece of paper, he's buying a business. And, when you, and, and we call this fundamentals. I mean, if, if I go to the doctor, there's certain fundamental things that should be ordered, my pulse, my blood pressure. If I go to a business, there's certain fundamental things that should be in order, and you learn that by playing the cash flow game. So I won't trade stocks, but I won't buy and hold them either. I'll look at a business, and exactly as Marin said, uh, I'm not buying the paper, I'm buying the financial statement. And so just like a real estate investor doesn't flip houses, uh, they'll keep the house as long as the fundamentals say keep it. And that's the same way I look at, at the businesses that I like to buy. You know, with real estate, we get a bunch of people together and we get a distribution. With stocks, we get a bunch of people together and they get a dividend. It's the same thing. So I couldn't agree with, with Marin Moore is he's looking at the business uh, not the not the stock itself and the ups and downs and the, the craziness of that. Buy a good business. So when, when Marin talked to me about a couple of years ago now, I got interested because my teacher was Buckminster Fuller. And Marin was talking about, he says, on planet Earth today, there's four billion billionaires. Well, that was in the 80s. Today, there's eight. But um, he started talking about cosmic accounting and all this. So in talking to Marin about cosmic accounting, which is the energy of the sun, plus uh, the being in Vancouver, then he started talking to me about carbon credits. And I have no idea what carbon credits was, but I trusted Marin because I knew he was doing this. I, I know his reputation. And so would you, so we invest, Kim and I invested in carbon credits. The money printing is out of control. The Fed already crashed the stock market and now they're coming for everything else. Take real estate, for example. In June, the Fed said the housing market needs a difficult correction, but Robert called them out just last week. He said, don't get swept up in the propaganda. If the Fed can't print it, invest in it. They can't print oil, they can't print real estate, and they can't print a new Van Gogh masterpiece. That's right. Experts know the art market is ripe for opportunity since it isn't at the mercy of the Fed. Look at the data. While the S&P is down over 24% this year, the art market has soared past its pre-pandemic levels. Now, the average piece is worth 26% more than this time last year. So how do you take advantage of this momentum and invest in art without needing millions? By investing with Masterworks. Roberts talked about them for months because Masterworks lets you invest in shares of paintings by Warhol, Picasso, and Banksy. And the results so far have been incredible. Six paintings sold for an average net return of 29% to their investors, including a sale as recently as August for a 33.1% return. No wonder their over 500,000 users have invested more than a half a billion dollars on Masterworks. And here's the best part. You can skip their wait list and try Masterworks for free by going to masterworks.art slash rich dad. That's masterworks.art slash rich dad. See important disclosures at masterworks.com slash CD. Feeling powerless over current events and your financial future? Financial freedom is your freedom. Robert Kiyosaki is the best-selling author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Over 40 million people have taken Robert's advice. Now it's your turn. Attend Robert's free virtual wealth building event. Claim your free access now at richdadfree.com. Don't wait. Access is limited. Go to richdadfree.com. That's richdadfree.com. So would you mind explaining what carbon credits are? Because I think, I agree with you. I think they could be bigger than Bitcoin. So what a carbon credit is, they've been around for 20 years, but they were, uh, think of Bitcoin in the early days. They weren't legitimate. There was no way to quantify them or certify them as real. Uh, what one carbon credit represents is the equivalent of one ton 
of carbon dioxide or CO2E equivalent, because there's nitric oxides, there's, there's methane, all these different uh, greenhouse gases taken out of the market, uh, out of the atmosphere. So one ton of greenhouse gas sequestered, you get one carbon credit certified now by companies like Vera or Gold Standard that are recognized by Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Exxon, Shell, BP, and the SEC. This is the key feature that people are not paying attention to. Carbon credits are a commodity. They're also a Geffen good. A Geffen good means is as the price goes up, the demand actually increases. That's very different than most commodities when the price goes up, people will buy less of or people will finance new substitutions. And we sell them right now. Companies are asking to buy it for the next 10, 20 years at three times higher. So imagine if I could produce gold for $500 an ounce, which would be in the lowest quartile and sell it for 2000. That's a great cash flow opportunity. So Mar Marin, what, what's the benefit of a company why would a company buy a carbon credit? So there's a few reasons. The first reason why, for example, Exxon, uh, BP, Shell, they have to buy because it's been legislated by their board, whether they like it or not, that they have to reduce their carbon footprint. Why? Because both the bond market who invests, remember the bond market's a lot bigger than the stock market. The bond market is demanding this of their investments and the shareholders have voted at the annual general meeting that they want this or management get replaced. So they have to do this to reduce their carbon uh, footprint. But in the end, it, and if they follow this game plan, their cost of capital decreases. Lloyd's of London came out and stated, we have done the research. Here's our math of the smartest actuarial science that we have and using evidence that for example, they stated that the, the 20 centimeter rise of Manhattan since 1950 on the sea level costed 30% more on Hurricane Sandy on insurance claims. All the insurance companies are now putting these numbers in before uh, there's something called the IPCC, which is funded by the UN, US, EU, UK, Harvard, Oxford. They all work together to publish this 3,900 page report. The biggest takeaway that I got being a numbers guy was one in 50 year climate occurrences are going to inc increase by 38.9 fold. That means the cost of insurance is going to go up. So either you play the game of decarbonizing, or if you want insurance coverage and you don't play this game, it's going to cost you way more money to get coverage because you're not playing ball. And there's going to be less money available. Meaning at the end, if you take two mining companies and one says, ah, oh, climate change is nonsense and I don't want to reduce my carbon footprint, they're going to be paying between 12 and 15% for money, which makes them not attractive to the investor. The mining company that does go green and reduces its carbon footprint, their cost of capital will be between two and 4%. These guys who are doing the green route are going to gobble up these guys and grow bigger and their shareholders are going to benefit because their cost of capital is lower. So that's why ultimately it comes down to balance sheet. Secondly, the big change. Now, I've been talking about this for a few years. The SEC, the chair of the SEC came out and he said, we really pay attention to uh, the decarbonization. The central banks are paying attention to this. Remember, it's the Bank of England that controls the insurance market. The, the UK insurance market is the largest non-medical insurance market in the world. The central banks are saying we have to only fund decarbonization. And on a balance sheet, when you have assets and liabilities, there's going to be a new line item, your carbon footprint. Companies like Exxon and Shell have to go in and reduce their carbon footprint. Well, how's an oil company or a cement company or a steel company going to do that? Carbon credits. It's about offsetting. You can't greenwash. Greenwash is a totally different thing. That's kind of like what politicians do. They just talk and cut ribbons, but you have to offset your footprint. And the fastest way to do that is carbon credits. And so how do how are we manufacturing carbon credits? So there's three different types of carbon credits. My favorite are what's called blue carbon credits. Those are ocean credits like mangrove forests, which a lot of people don't realize are being um, uh, cut down at a faster rate than the Amazon rainforest. Why? Dynamite rolls. People like dynamite rolls, shrimp. And it's the best environment 
to farm shrimp. And who's doing it? The Chinese fish companies. They're doing it illegal off the coast of Mexico, off the coast of Brazil, off the coast of Indonesia. These habitats are getting significantly impacted. So you can go to these areas, you prevent the illegal fishing, but that costs money. The governments aren't funding this stuff. So companies are buying the rights to these tracts of land. One square mile of, of ocean absorbs 10 times the amount of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere than the same one square mile on land of a forest of what's called green carbon credits. So the blue carbon credits are more valuable because you absorb uh, in a smaller space, the same space 10 times, but you also have a massive positive biodiversity effect. You save the, the coral reefs, the turtles, the sharks, the dolphins, all of the other bird sanctuaries, all these other biodiversity factors. Then you have, so what happens is as you prevent the uh, illegal harvesting or chopping of these mangroves, then you get a company like Vera to certify the decarbonization or the absorption. Remember trees, they absorb algae, absorbs greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, and they calculate, and then they certify you, that is recognized by the SEC, by all the big banks, by all the big companies, a firm, and, and it costs a lot of money to do this. It's not like you can just do it in your backyard because you, know, you get a buddy to certify this. There's a process to it, and that's why it's become a commodity, and that's how you go about it, and that's what Delta Airlines is now advertising. If you go to Google, you just type in, buy a flight, it's going to have its price, and then it's going to say your carbon footprint. It used to be how long the flight would be between connections and your total time. That's been replaced by carbon footprints, right? You're going to have, you know, MasterCard's already come out with a credit card that calculates its carbon footprint. So now when Exxon and Shell and Google, the next phase is they're going to put this onto their employees and your bonus Remember, gas companies are doing this already. Their bonuses are based off of the carbon footprint reduction. So you want a bonus? You got to hit all your key metrics, you know, your key metrics like uh, your efficiency, your cash flows, your environmental standards, and eventually carbon footprint. And when that comes into the balance sheet, once it becomes prime time, nobody's talking about this yet, but that's how you make the big fortunes. As you guys know, you want to be buying things before they're popular. And that's exactly what it is with carbon credits right now. So the companies like an Exxon or a BP or Delta, they're not necessarily reducing their own carbon credit, but they are supporting and funding projects. Exactly. That offsetting. That's, that's, a, uh, that's what exactly what I'm writing about right now is that you don't have to be this or that. You can work together on it. Totally. But, Capitalism, it, Robert, you said that you and Kim were the first people and you guys had the great wisdom that I, because I'm such a math guy and I focus on the balance sheet. But when the two of you said capitalism is going to save the environment, that was the key line. Like that was like the, you know, when you look what Andy said about, you know, the rich dad, poor dad, the solution was in the title. You nailed it. You and Kim said capitalism is what's going to save the environment. Any comments, or Andy? Yeah. One of the things you and Kim have always said as you've mentored me is that entrepreneurs solve problems. And when some people politically see a, a problem, they think they can fix it with legislation and make a rule and make a law and reduce freedom. And other people, when they see a problem, they say, well, let's innovate and let's solve it. And to me, the, I love what Marin said, that capitalism is just a contest to see who can solve the most problems at the lowest costs. And if you can solve a problem at the lower cost than the other guy, you're going to do well, and the other guy's not. So I, I couldn't agree more with what Marin said. Yeah, if, if I could say another thing, Robert and Kim, um, how important is it for us to always be students and forever to be updated? I mean, the education I had 10 years ago is obsolete. Uh, I'm, I'm, I do, I'd say 80% of my time right now is in study. And, uh, and I think I'm just grateful I have the time to do it. And it's fascinating because as a father with two kids, uh, we need capitalists, including those two, to innovate to make their world brighter. And so this idea that I go to school, I spend four years, I'm done with school, and now I go work, work, work. Um, there's an innovation for a need for learning. And I will tell you that I think, and maybe the more valuable thing than a, a credit, a carbon credit is, 
is a disposition to learn and a, and a value of learning and educating oneself to stay up on this and stay ahead. And if someone's listening and says, what can I do about this? My message is always the same as an education advocate. I says, boy, it's tough to lose if you're going to learn all the time. And that's one of the biggest things I'm grateful to being on panels like this. Marin, I thank you. I've learned a ton just in this. So it's been very valuable. Thank you. When he started talking to me about carbon credits, it was the spiritual side. What can we do to solve a problem and solve many problems at one time? And that's why we invested. Um, I, what I love is to Andy's point, it's all about learning. You know, we have great mentors, we have great teachers. Um, this whole carbon credit, every, everything that's happening in the world right now is changing so rapidly that it's so, it's hard to keep up with the learning because there's so much out there. Um, but this was really, really valuable. And I thank you, Mara, and I thank you, Andy, for being part of the program. And I thank the, the people that have viewed in, that are listening, that are watching right now. Thank you because um, you're doing what needs to be done. The most important thing to prepare is, is to get educated and then take that education, that information and take some action. Um, and we always say to start small, take small steps, especially when you're doing something new for the first time, because you're gonna make a lot of mistakes. There's gonna be a learning curve. But the most important thing is you get that education and then you've got to get in the game. You've got to take some action in order to be prepared. So I thank all of you for being part of this program. And Andy, I'd like to hear your final comments. Well, just a big thank you and a congratulations for everyone tuning in. There's so many people that do a lot of talking about wanting to get better, talking about wanting to you know, improve their lives and elevate their well-being financially. But the fact you're here, the fact you're watching, you're turning, it means you value your education. And I'm just uh, grateful to be a part of this, Robert and Kim. And I get to hear from people like Marin uh, because I know you guys. So Marin, I uh, appreciate following you. And I thought your insight on fundamentals, buying the business, not the, the paper, was, uh, was wonderful today. So thank you, Robert. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Marin and uh, Rich Dad World and everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Marin. The system yeah. is inverted. Uh, I saw it firsthand. Uh, but look, there's a fortune to be made in solving these problems. Yeah. Andy, Kim, you know, Robert, they have it spot on. Anyone watching this, you know, there's some great aspects of being rich and there's some negative aspects of being rich. But if you want to go down that quest and you're willing to spend the time and education. We're not promoting anything. I just want to be up front and have... Kim and I have invested with Marin, but we invested him because it solves a very big problem. And he's a very good man. So it's Katusa Research. As is a final saying, as this, all people blushing this dad's world, it's about having a coach and a mentor. And today, I think most people's problems are because they had crappy mentors called school teachers. Like Marin, my, my, my dad was a school teacher, you know, PhD. And I also gave him crap on it. PhD, poor, helpless, and desperate. That's all I ever told him. And my, my rich dad said both were mentors. Both taught me the value of one thing, education. And so the reason we have Rich Dad's World is for you to be educated and take action. Because action without you know, education without action is nothing. You have to do something. As Maria Montessori, she's an entrepreneur in education, as Maria Montessori says, what the hand does, the mind remembers. And that's why we created the cash flow board game. I learned, I learned real estate playing Monopoly, you know, four greenhouses, 1031, tax break exchange, red hotels. But I learned by moving the pieces around. So the reason I have Rich Dad World is these guys look for your new mentor, your new teacher, the new person to take you to the next level of your life. Kim, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Marin. Thank you, Andy. Um, wonderful teachers. Wonderful teachers. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in and thank you for making your financial education a priority in your life.